We're starting a new series of messages today called Better Together. It's on the subject of unity, and I think it's the appropriate topic as our church transitions to new leadership over the next couple of weeks and months. It's uh, huge that churches stick together, and that's our hope through this series of messages Sometimes people ask me as I'm getting ready to wind down my time here, what, is, what are some of your memories? What are favorite books? What are your you know, best things that happen here? What are the hardest things? Stuff like that, little categories. And in my mind, I have uh, favorite books. I'm trying to take home a book or two every day when I go home these days. And sometimes my books wind up in the dumpster, and sometimes they wind up at the public library. And uh, sometimes I give them to people that I think might like them. But, you know, nobody likes a lot of books in there cluttering up their house. I, I do. I like them. And thankfully, my wife's tolerating me taking some of my best things home. But um, favorite books. One of my favorite books is uh, not a theological work or a Bible work or a biography of a great Christian, but it's the book called Band of Brothers. Maybe you saw the miniseries uh, over the years. The book was written by Stephen Ambrose, and it's the story of Easy Company of the 101st Battalion um, in World War II. And it's intense. And the book is better than the series. Uh, the unit was formed in 1942, and they went to training camp, enduring torturous training in the hills in the mountains of Georgia called Camp Tekoa. They learned combat techniques, but of course their specialty was the ability to parachute out of airplanes, thus the 101st Airborne. The standards for this unit were very high and many soldiers didn't make the cut. Some of them were injured in their training and didn't recover in time to make uh, Normandy. Uh, those who did survive and continue on were treated ruthlessly by their training officer, First Lieutenant Herbert Sobel. He was a mean man. He wasn't great at combat and got demoted out of the combat unit when the time came for war. But in training, he was the right man, although everybody hated him. He, he forced his soldiers to march a hill called Kirahi in the heat of the Georgia day in full uniform, full equipment. And after a long march, when the men were completely exhausted, he would pull surprise inspections and he would find a minute problem wrong with one of the soldiers and make that soldier march the hill again. And every now and then when a soldier was found guilty of a minor offense and ordered to march again, the punishment just didn't fit the crime and everybody knew it. But this guy was demanding. And who could argue? And on one occasion the day was almost over and... He started out his march alone as the sun was setting. And the other men who were dismissed saw this injustice taking place and said, that's not right. They couldn't let their buddy march alone. So they grabbed their gear and their backpacks and they ran to catch him and they marched the hill together. They would do this together. And that was their secret of their battle experience. They would do things together. Uh, the movie description is tremendous. It says there was a time when the world asked ordinary men to do extraordinary things together. They would uh, parachute behind German lines in Normandy. Together, they would spearhead attacks when called upon into the, some of the most resistant areas of German occupation. The band of brothers were ordinary men from small towns and large cities across the states. But they found that their greatest strength was in each other. 
And it is really the stuff of legends. I got goosebumps right now just thinking of some of the things I read and saw. But it is a perfect description for how God wants His church to be. Listen to these instructions. This is not so much a to-do list as what we're supposed to be. This is what God wants us to be. And Casey kind of referenced it already in his prayer time. This is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all, through all, and in all. It's one of those passages that you need to know and have marked in your Bible. In the first three chapters of his letter, Paul Let's us in on God's big secret. The book of Ephesians is magnificent. Uh, he talks about this secret, this mystery that's now been revealed. And the secret is that God loves all people and wants all people involved and adopted into His family. All people from all walks of life, from all cultures. There are walls that divide us though. But in Christ, the Savior unites us. So we have this new identity. Yes, we're from that culture and that tribe and that language. Yes, we are that. But we have this new identity and this new purpose in Christ. So God wants to display this message through His church. God would want His church to be a band of brothers and sisters, bringing the incompatible together to live in harmony. But you know the church, the history of the church is filled with division. Sometimes when I get together with my buddy, uh, who's a minister over at Northgate, John, uh, we pray together and we meet together. And he reminds me, he says, Mike, how many churches are there in Buffalo? And when he asked me that, I'm starting to. He says, stop that. There's one church, right? There's one church. I want to believe that, but we don't act like that, do we? One church? Well, there were two men who were influential priests in the Catholic Church. They had been studious, and they had realized that the, the church that they served had wandered away from the truth. So the two men met together to explore their views. They were both leaders. They were both causing some issues in the overall Catholic Church. They were both kind of being looked down upon. So they met together to see what they would have in common. Fifteen issues. They worked through the first fourteen issues. They agreed with each other completely on these first 14 things. Uh, the person of Christ, the atonement of Christ, the work of grace, the nature of the church, and on and on they went. 14 they agreed on. They, they came to the 15th point, the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Now, I would think that if we had 10 people stand up here today, they would probably all give slightly different perspectives on the Lord's Supper, right? What does it mean in Scripture? How do we apply it today? You hear the guys come up on Sunday morning and they give a different point of view, a different aspect, but it always boils down to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and what it means to us. That's where it always comes back to. Well, during this discussion between these two influential guys, they disagreed. Martin Luther said the body of Christ is actually in the bread and the juice. And Ulrich Zing, Zingwilly, Zwingli said 
he thought communion was more of a memorial to remember what Christ had done for us on the cross. Luther said, after much discussion, Luther said, well, if you really feel that strongly about it, <clears throat> we can't be brothers. Zwingli said, what are you talking about? We are brothers. We're brothers in Christ already. But Luther said, no, I can't go that far with you on this matter. He couldn't accept it. And because of this one disagreement, this one point, two denominations were eventually formed. The Lutherans went through Germany and into the Nordic countries. The Presbyterians went into Switzerland. Of course, as you know, they both made their way to the U.S. eventually. Both groups loved the Lord. Both groups revere Christ. Both groups plan to go to heaven together because of the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Both groups actually practice the Lord's Supper. But this one difference of opinion divided the body of Christ. And it's what a tragedy. What a tragedy. But you know how it is. It doesn't take a lot to divide us. Ephesians reminds us that since you belong to Christ, there is a different standard. It is not about you anymore. It's a high standard to live up to. It's in verse 1. I feel like a big finger from heaven is pointing down at Bauer saying, you, you. I don't care what anybody else does and anybody else says. You live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You do it. It's on you. Get it done. We've been chosen and adopted and redeemed and forgiven, and God has lavished His grace on us, and He expects us to show it. We're not like we used to be. We're different. Here's the big question. Am I living a life worthy of the calling I have received? I can't answer that for you, and you can't answer that for me. Just look at yourself. You have God's Spirit inside you, He's helping you. He's teaching you. He's encouraging. You have God's family around you, encouraging you, supporting you. But often people lower the standard. I, I know over the years people have asked me this, especially students asked me this back in the day. They wonder how much they can get away with and still be a follower of Christ. You know, after all, doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible, everything is permissible? but not everything is beneficial. It does say that in the Bible, right? It says it. Everything's beneficial. So kids ask me over the years, is it okay to get a tattoo? More recently, is it okay for me to use cannabis? More recently, is it okay for me to bet on NFL football games? Is that okay? Well, all these issues that I just raised, those three are all legal in the state of New York, right? They're all legal. So, yeah, uh, you're free to do what you want. Yes, you are. But there is a higher standard involved here. If you're in Christ, there's a higher standard. Uh, is your conduct worthy of the calling you have received? You get to decide, but as you decide, here's the deal. God wants to put his redeeming work in you on display for the world to see. You have been chosen and adopted and redeemed and forgiven. He has lavished his grace on you. He's placed his spirit within you. So live a life worthy of that. And it's on your conscience, but live a life worthy of that. The Greek word for uh, worthy is a pretty interesting word. I like word pictures. I'm not so good with the Greek, but I like the pictures that it describes. It means to be of equal weight. And it's the picture of a set of scales. I put Christ and his calling of me on this side, and I put my life on this side. 
the calling on my life is heavy, isn't it? It's indescribable. The cost for, for what has been done for me, it's deep. It weighs down the scale. Then I put my life over here, and am I living a life worthy of that calling? And so often when I examine myself, the calling is weighing down here, and my flimsy life is up here. And how can I make it equal? What do I need to do to live a life worthy of the calling I've received in Him? Um, God's redeeming grace versus my life demonstrating that I'm redeemed. Everybody gets to answer that for themselves. Okay, I'm not here to judge you. I got my own issues I'm working on. So yes, you're free to do whatever you want. Yes, the Bible says everything's permissible, right? It says that if you want to pull that out. But the question is, does your lifestyle fit your calling? So I adopted this slogan I learned from Bill Gothard, a teacher of seminars, many, many years ago. He just made it simple for him. He just said, others can, I cannot. I thought, that's pretty smart. That's pretty simple. Others can do that. But for I am in Christ and my calling and where he's at, where, how he's working to me, I can't do that. So you get to make your own decisions. Simply remember that the Lord has lavished his grace on you and he asks you to live up to it. Now the world needs a model like the Band of Brothers for how unity works. We're better together uh, the, the writer gives us these five fabulous qualities that are required for a band of brothers and that are required in a church. And so often we hear of power struggles and disagreements and people get offended and they walk away for whatever reason and say, we're done, that's that. But that's not living a life worthy of the calling you've received. That's taking care of you. It's not about you anymore. Remember, there's a higher standard. So the first quality that he brings up is one that just hits us right between the eyes. Be completely humble. You want relationships to click? Then check your ego at the door. Uh, take a back seat. These words had to be a shock to the guys and girls who first read this letter in Ephesus. And a lot of people read this today and just say, it could not work in our culture. <laughs> Times have changed. You can't be completely humble or you'll get run over. Well, uh, just take the back seat. Pride is the source of almost every quarrel and pride is the source of almost every war. Winston Churchill once said of one of his arrogant colleagues, he stole a line from You'll get it. He stole a line from somebody and he says, there but for the grace of God goes God. <laughs> that guy is, you know, his big head. He's scratching his ears out here. He's got it gone. Human beings crave attention and approval. And honestly, I think that's why social media is such a big deal in our culture. Uh, yeah, it's a way to communicate. I get that. But it's also a way to put yourself out there and to be noticed and seen and approved and affirmed. And then you start playing that comparison game of, oh my goodness, I'm not as cool as that person. And it goes downhill from there. We crave attention, but the big secret is we have this new worth, this new value, this new identity in Christ. We have His attention. We have His approval. Next week, Mitch will preach on a magnificent text from Philippians chapter 2. That's the explanation of how God emptied himself and became a man. It's there that we learn to consider other people better than ourselves. So Christianity is a fight for the bottom, not the top. And that is demonstrated by the Lord Jesus himself. 
Be completely humble and, second, be gentle. And I think that being gentle is probably a, a quality that is overlooked in most of us because we think being gentle means being a wimpy and I'm not backing down. Oh no, I'm going to have my own way. If we back down, we look weak and we can't have that. But that's really nothing could be further from the truth when it comes to gentleness. At his trial, I think you could say Jesus was gentle. He was quiet. He didn't answer his critics. On the other hand, he had uh, how many thousand angels at his disposal that he could have called to be there at a moment's notice to rescue him? He had power. He just didn't use it. Sometimes it's said that a horse is gentle. Well, that doesn't mean it's wimpy or weak. It just means it's strong, but it's got control. So this should accompany our relationships. Want to fight? Uh, just back off. We know you can fight. We know you're strong. But gentleness displays the work of Christ in us. Then the third quality is to be patient. Um, this means to have a long fuse. <laughs> Even Jesus became frustrated with his guys. You'll remember, he said in Matthew 17, how long must I bear with you? Yeah, sounds like a parent, right? It sounds like a parent. How long must I bear with you? But it is... Uh, it doesn't take long for our differences to show, and it's very easy to throw up our hands and walk away. But the Lord urges us to come to a common mind, a consensus. And uh, very honestly, that's one of the great qualities of our church leadership. Um, an issue comes before our elders. There are three elders. There's never a vote that two win and one, one loses. They don't vote. Never have voted in uh, many, many years here. It doesn't mean that we agree on everything. No, it just means that we're trying to come to a common mind on matters, a consensus. And it's hard. We come from different backgrounds and we see it differently. But... We slow down and we listen and we back up and we reconsider and we respect and we're trying to be completely humble and gentle and we're trying to have a long fuse and eventually, sometimes it's weeks and months, but sometimes longer, but we come to a, a consensus, a common mind and it's a band of brothers because of things like that. Verse 2 also says we should be bearing with one another in love. <laughs> Remember the anonymous poem from back in the day? It says it so well. It says, To live above with saints we love, O Lord, that will be glory. But to live below with saints we know, well, that's another story. <laughs> yeah, there was a church... I told this probably 10 times over the years, but I still love it. There was a church that was holding a public meeting to decide if they should spend the money to buy a new chandelier. And the debate became heated, and finally an old farmer stood up. He could take no more of the nonsense. He said, look, I don't even know what the argument is about here. Half you people here can't even spell chandelier. And second, if we had a chandelier, 98% of you wouldn't know how to play it anyway. <laughs> and finally, our lobby is so dingy, what we need to do is get some new lights in this place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got those kind of people in your group, right? How do you work through it? Well, you bear with one another in love. And then this from verse 3. Make every effort, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And I would ask you, this is a test question when you disagree. Are you making every effort? Are you making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit? It's the obligation of every band, everyone in the band of brothers, and it's the obligation of everyone in the body of Christ. 
and it often requires large amounts of humility and gentleness and patience and bearing with one another in love. Uh, have you made every effort? Uh, the American Christian is uh, frankly spoiled with all the options that we have. Uh, when we don't like something, we flee. And when we flee, we don't mature. We don't put together the one another instructions that we get from Scripture to pray for one another, to bear with one another, to forgive one another, to support one, to encourage one another. And there's like 15 of them. We don't do that because we just had enough and we're going to go our own ways. We don't make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit because when we disagree, we leave. Deb and I, you know, were most recently in, in, in Iraq and uh, we were in a mid-sized town there. We met a friend of a friend who knew something about us and invited us to go to church with him on Sunday morning, 6.30 Sunday morning. Sunday's a work day in that place. The day's off for Saturday, I'm sorry, and Friday and Saturday. So as far as we knew, this was the only church that honored Christ in this mid-sized town. And uh, we didn't speak the language, of course. And I'm talking about this is the only kind of Christ-honoring church that we heard of anywhere around. We went. It was very Catholic in style. In culture, the women sat in the back and the men got the prime time seats down front. And that's how it was. And uh, just us showing up there turned heads. Oh, there's some new folks here today. Cool. And we're sitting, I'm sitting with my friend, my new friend, and uh, I can't really converse with him all I know is when he stands up, I need to stand up. And when he sits down, I need to sit down. And, you know, the scripture is read and there's a reverence there. And as I sat there, the Lord impressed on me not the many differences between us, but the things that we had in common. I started making this list in my head. Uh, these people love the Lord just like I do. They got up early to be here. It means something to them. They were very much in the minority in their culture. They had a history of suffering. They observed the Lord's Supper. They read the Word of God. They had a reverence and respect. They welcomed us. They came to meet us. As I said, Sunday is a work day in that culture, but many put their work off and came to talk with us and said, hey, do you have breakfast plans? We would love to have you come for breakfast. We would ha be happy to take you to our house. But knowing that would delay their work, our host decided that was not a good idea and we shouldn't do that. But they were just so eager to show us hospitality. Next time you come, maybe we can do that. Or next week we can do that. That'd be great. A line from an old song came to my mind as I sat there with those guys. I love you with the love of my Lord. I can see in you the glory of my King and I love you with the love of my Lord. And if I lived in that town, I would first of all tell you there's not many options that I am aware of. And I could stay home and worship on my own or I guess I could worship on the internet and if you went there, oh, you would find probably 25 things that you don't like and that you disagree with. I know that. But I, I think if I lived there, that's where Deb and I would go without complaint. I hope to do so again someday. And I hope to take some of you with me someday to do that very thing. What I'm saying is what Paul wrote here. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And when we do, we display that Christ is at work in our lives.
Now, keep in mind that this letter was written to a diverse people, people from a pagan background, people from a strict Jewish culture, people who were formerly involved as sorcerers and black magic. But now they were new in Christ and they were in a minority in their culture. They had a history of, of, uh, of being tormented by the outsiders. They were all kinds of backgrounds there, but now they're in one church. How could they live in harmony? Well, uh, you've heard this before, but you can tie two tails of a, a uh, the tails of two cats together. They're united, but uh, I'm sorry, but they're not unified, right? They're together, but they're they're not together. So let's focus on the things they had in common, and I think that's probably where every disagreement should start. Okay. We disagree on this, but let's let's back up. What do what do you and I have in common here? Well, turns out there are seven things that these new believers have in common, right? You you know them. I bet you could tell them to me. Uh, we'll just move through them quickly. But there's one body. You've been adopted into the body of Christ now, and we're God's family, and and we're. We're in Him and we're supposed to represent Him. We do not oppose each other. We, we work together. The body doesn't oppose other parts of the body. It works together with them. So there's one body. There's one spirit. Having believed, you all were marked in Him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So you have this new power inside of you. The Spirit helps us obey and preserve the unity. There's one hope. That mean, means there's a lot of things that could divide us, right? But we live with this confidence and this purpose that God's got us. Our hope is in God Almighty and the Maker of heaven and earth. We have one Lord. Our allegiance is to the one who is head over it all. Our, our former connections become secondary because now we're in Him. We're not competitors. We're a band of brothers and He's our leader. My... Granddaughter Sydney has drugged Deb and I into many musicals over the years. And I found that my favorite part of the musical, other than greeting her at the very end of it all, my favorite part of the musical is at the end, the chorus line. You know, when all the actors come out and onto the stage for recognition and they grab each other's hands and they bow and the crowd claps and uh, the, the ones who are in the most obscure role and the ones who are stars in the lead role, they, they all join hands together. I love it. They take a bow. The crowd applauds. Uh, parents are wiping tears from their eyes. That's my baby up there. And they worked hard to present this musical. And they did something together that's a beautiful thing. And they deserve their con our congratulations for their success. It's a beautiful thing. It's a picture of what God desires for His church. All of us coming out, and God's going, Dang, on, you guys are good. Look at what you did together. Well, we share one faith going on here. There are many things we differ on widely. I know that. Uh, there's only a few things that we agree on together. I would say that we're probably... 90% of us here are Bills fans, and we care about the Bills. Uh, if we talked about the Bills uh, for 10 minutes, there would be a lot of disagreement over this and that, and this and that, and how we're going to do tonight. And if we only did it like this, why can't we do it like that? If we'd done it better, we would have won that game. And all we, back and forth we go. But we, I'm trying to say is we, we don't agree on very many things exactly together. Very, very few things we agree on. And one of those things is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. We agree on that. And without His atoning sacrifice for our sins, we're totally lost. We agree on that. So that's the, the one faith. We have this shared belief, this shared commitment. It overshadows the minor differences that we have. And there's one baptism. 
this is really the source of our unity because we all share this common experience. How do you get into Christ? You're buried with him in baptism. You're raised to walk a brand new life. This shows our commitment to the Lord and our obedience to him. And it's how we're identified in him. And those who've been baptized share that commonality. Well, finally, there's one God and Father who's over all, through all, and in all. In the pagan world of Ephesus, there were many idols to choose from. But these believers had come to see that there's one God who is over all other gods. And he's in charge and he rules the world and I've allowed him to rule my life. So in the family of God, we're a band of brothers. Everybody counts. Everybody's expected to be involved. Everybody has a role to play. And this is what it means to live a life worthy of the calling we've received in Christ. He wants to display his work through our unity. And unity begins with you. Is it about you or is it about him? So if you're at odds with somebody, uh, we need to make it right. If, you're, if you aren't pulling your share of the load, I encourage you to get involved and do that. And if you aren't in Christ, the way to do that is to be buried with him in baptism and raised to walk a new life. This is the band of brothers, and we're better together when we live like that. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, thank you for the Word of God. It is rich and deep and way deeper than this guy can go. Just scratching the surface of it is enough to make me think for a long time. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would speak to each heart just now. I pray that your Spirit would convict hearts just now. I pray that in just this moment of quiet, everybody would consider their place in the body and their role in living a life worthy of the calling they've received and their opportunity to display this unity to the world. Help our church to do that is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.